Florence poets invade the invisible fountain. And once again, we are back, courtesy of Luke Cavagnac, our good friend Luke. And if you enjoy his artwork, please support the proprietor in all ways, okay? He's a really good guy, and he's an even better artist. So. Our first poet of the evening will be Brooks Robard. And These are Brooke... all about grandchildren, acts of love. A set of fresh conditions presents itself three feet off the ground, where only yesterday the world rode a white horse through the woods. Now I am holding hands with less than two, not at ease, but patient and willing to learn. I see sticks have power in the swinging. Bend them, and they snap into more sticks. Something unreadable, but an accomplishment. Flowers, rocks, call. At a playground, three other small fry fly high on swings, slip down the curving slide on their stomachs, laughing, inventing a life unburdened by thoughts, disconnected from the present. I give myself my all about grandchildren, acts of love. A set of fresh conditions presents itself three feet off the ground, where only yesterday the world rode a white horse through the woods. Now I am holding hands with less than two, not at ease, but patient and willing to learn. I see sticks have power in the swinging, bend them and they snap into more sticks. Something unreadable, but an accomplishment. Flowers, rocks, call. At a playground, three other small fry fly high on swings, slip down the curving slide on their stomachs, laughing, inventing a life unburdened by thoughts, disconnected from the present. I give myself, my, I give my little self, a robin's egg, a miracle of blue too fragile not to break in his hand. We toss the shards into the garden where lilies of the valley shed their scent. This morsel of life is not the sign I'm ser searching for, hunched and keen. Well, Carl, will you or someone, you know, give me a high sign when I've reached my eight minutes? Thanks. Okay. This is called Call of the Wild. As parents drive away, a little boy learning to talk points to his chest, to himself. I know, says Grandma, who holds him in her arms, but you can't go with them. Let's take a walk instead. Up the street, the black cat shadows a tiny rabbit. Grandma reaches for the victim, but he wriggles away. The cat continues his pursuit. Slowly, out of the shrubs, across a dark tongue of road, into the brush by a stone wall, Grandma shoots the cat away while an airplane floats noisily through the sky. One bird-like scream follows another. Bye, bye, said the little boy. This one is called Crazy Quilt. Forgive me for the flowers you stepped on, for the ant I crushed after you put the rock back over a centipede we found on our bug hunt. I promise I will not deface the quilt over our hideaway with post-it notes or send threatening letters to your unborn sisters. I confess I threw away your self-portrait, which I found too illegible to deliver. Besides, it gave me a cramp in my gut. Please stop clipping the wings of birds or I swear I'll plug up the drain you unclogged with a card that says, no mowing here. This is called Doll Baby. June sits in the stroller, ready to roll her eyes, perpetually open, arms to 
Who knows how long she would wait to prop her mouth into a little smile. Her voice, box broke so many years ago. The color of her cloth skin, vaguely orange, shows above one-piece pajamas blue. It doesn't matter if she's outside, since the air isn't speaking of rain. She could always wear a scarf or stay inside with her closed throat and the other toys on the shelf spinning the stillness of a nap. <clears throat> this is called Little Heart Heaver. Each week, we travel new ground in the act of becoming. It's as if we start over, plummeting from the same ground to new territory. Our conversations deepen, delving into the past. At nap time, we cannot find baby. Later, awake, we look in a closet ne nest and find her sleeping. Shh, my little self warns me. Up the hill to the stone wall, we have helped mortar with sticks and flat stones. Little one decides when to run with flailing legs, when to turn, when to run back to the, hall, the wall. We stand tall, backs against it. Joyful, we race, turn, run in our crazy, graceful dance. A green grass hill behind the house rises steep, Little self finds freedom, careening wildly down it because my hand will catch him, fearless in the face of gravity. Wooden boards piled next to the house like pickup sticks shift and spring as he walks across them, holding my hand. I am the string on his balloon. Thank you. Thank you, high flyer. This one uh, is dedicated for Sean. Sean is my five-year-old grandson who lost a balloon. And his mother called me and asked, said he wanted me to write a poem. And that would make him feel better about losing his balloon. So, my blue balloon. It's, by the way, it's hard to write poems on demand, as all of you who are poets know. The color of the sky, my balloon loves to fly. Then I let go of the string, and my balloon flew away. So I was sad all yesterday. Mommy said not to cry, but rent an airplane and fly after my balloon like a bird. Then open the window wide and tell my balloon, don't hide. Instead, climb back inside with me. Come down, back down home to see just how much fun we'll have playing together and happy. Two more minutes. Two more poems? Two more poems. Okay. All right. Let me, this one, not, you know, there's something joyous about small children and, you know, the love that adults feel for them. But things are not always... Uh, you know, sweet and, and nice. So here's one called Night Terrors. Small feet, feet pound out rhythms of rage on the bedroom floor. Eyes wide, a little boy chants with three-year-old screams, pajama clad and rigid. No grown-up embrace can quell the storm, nor words will it soothe one who looks but does not see or hear with reason, lost in rehearsals of terror. What troubled dreams drive so much passion, bring on such turbulence? Midnight lullabies do not calm nor end the anguish of isolation. Is innocence finished before the womb empties? Children must live where we do, take on our fears, our pain before peace and sleep, limp body, return. Let me find one last one. All right, I'll put this one I know is passing around, so it's called Captain Chaos. A little Jackson Pollock explodes across the grass, 
into my solid mass through the glasses and hat fly. At home, he drips his belongings along a path to his toys, boxed on bookshelves, yanking, dumping, piling up. He captures the floor with destructive constructions, atomic energy. Upstairs, books, magazines, papers scatter a vast gallery of paintings opposite of a universe in any adult order. What now, brown cow? Captain makes a big mess out of pure joy. Can you clean it all up with a toy truck? Big load after load. Thank you. But the next poet is Mary Ann Gambaro. Okay, the first poem I'm reading tonight is called The Flowering Dogwood. She planted it the year they built the house, the sapling already showing demure pink flowers, an icon on the front lawn, a showpiece each spring, as the brick and stone house evolved into a home. The dogwood was the setting for family photos at Easter, or later, if the fickle holiday arrived too early. But the focus of those pictures was always the tree, the people only supporting cast. New cars, too, were posed in front of that tree for their maiden photos before they were marred with scratches and dents inflicted by shopping carts. Even their new shine eclipsed by the tree's beauty. Their daughter was married in front of that tree, both ripe and in full bloom in the warmth of May. For five decades, she watched the birds stoke up on its berries each fall before they departed. The woman and the tree aged together, trunks bent and gnarled under the weight of life. Though a fraction of its height, she stood on tiptoe to spray it with potions and concoctions she couldn't pronounce. At her direction, the gardener dutifully cut out dead branches, an arboreal version of a bad comb over. When her husband died, she left the house, which she said was no longer her home, but she always asked about her tree. Not wanting to obstruct the view of their lovely new house, the new owners quickly cut down that rotting old dogwood and placed its bones at the curb for trash. Maria came to America, and it's a sequence. One, the husband. Because his wife had died giving birth to their third child in as many years, he sent for the sister. Though only 14, she had grown strong farming the poor soil in the shadow of Mount Vesuvius, her already broad hips designed by nature for the tasks ahead. Two, the crossing. On the ship, crammed with anxious women and crying children, her stomach echoed the heaving waves, a harbinger of the sickness which would rack her young body five times more in years to come. But it was all right, for at the end of the journey, her sister waited, she thought. Three, the arrival. At Ellis Island, he told her and waited patiently while she wept. When she had no more tears for her dead sister, she gathered into her arms the infant who had killed his mother and sang softly to him in Italian. My third one tonight's a little bit lighter, um, Lunar Mardi Gras, which is sort of a nature fantasy poem. The full moon floats above the oak as her goddess Artemis keeps watch. A passing band of clouds surrounds her, a celestial Mardi Gras parade, sailing through the sky on crystalline floats that, though silhouetted, can't conceal their gaudy costumes woven by ice-fractured prisms, nor raucous music from silent saxophones and cymbals raised in celebration. Demanding tribute, they shout, show us your breast. Coyly, she complies. The clouds move on, leaving the moon floating above the oak, decked out in Mardi Gras beads as Artemis beams. And my last one is a sequence also, um, it's a history poem, and for any of you who've been to Halifax, Nova Scotia, um, you can't go too far in that town without knowing the story. It's called Halifax Harbor. One, Leviathan cruise ships glide above salt-bleached bones and splintered docks, revelers deaf to century-old spectral screams. The Micmac Indians called it Chibukdo, Big Harbor. 
so deep that even maritime winters can't freeze it, perfect for cruise ships and convoys. Those not preoccupied with bingo and buffets may listen and learn how, during the Great War, the war to end all wars, Allied ships gathered awaiting escort across the Atlantic by fiercer vessels. How, at 7.30 a.m. on December 6, 1917, the French munition ship Mont Blanc left her anchorage at the mouth of the harbor to join a gathering convoy, then collided with the Emo, a Norwegian, bound, a Norwegian ship bound for New York to collect re relief supplies for Belgium. A collision, a fire, a captain and crew abandoning ship, the ultimate act of cowardice, a floating bomb ablaze heading for the docks, an explosion unlike the world had known a generation before Hiroshima. Dead, nearly 2,000, homes destroyed, more than 1,600, homes damaged, 12,000. Not a pane of glass left intact on either side of the harbor, yet miles from any enemy gun. Two, more than 500 miles and nearly a century away, a white spruce towers above the Boston Common in gratitude. More than 500 miles and nearly a century ago, they came by train in less than a winter's day, among the first to arrive and the last to leave. Nurses and doctors solved burns, bandaged wounds, sawed off limbs and excised eyes. Each Christmas, the children of those maimed and injured send a tree to Boston to honor the ones who tirelessly did what they could to help in hell. Limbs amputated, 25. Eyes removed, 250. Injured treated, more than 9,000. Three. They're mostly gone now. Till recently, you could see them in the nursing homes around Halifax, some missing an eye, some totally blind, never to see again, the storms coming in over the sea, or herring gulls slicing through summer skies, or rampant purple lupins bivouacked on June hillsides. They were children settling into their morning schoolwork when they heard the explosion and ran to the windows, hopeful visions of fireworks shattered by exploding glass shrapnel piercing young corneas. They were the luckier ones. Four, I tried to warn him to tell him that the Mont Blanc with that cargo, wet and dry picric acid, 300 tons, TNT, 200 tons, gun cotton, 10 tons, benzol, 35 tons, a floating bomb she was, was ablaze in the harbor, right outside his little railway office. Aye, the harbor was a sight to see in those days. Ships from all over the world with supplies of food and munitions and troops waiting for the warships to take them across the sea to the front. Some days it looked as if you could walk across the harbor on all those boats and never wet your boots. Coleman, I think his name was, Vincent Coleman. He had kissed the wife and three barons when he left that morning and walked the five blocks to his office like any other day. No doubt put his muffler a little tighter since December is like to blow here about. I'd seen him around the dock when I was working there. They were expanding the rail line to support the war effort, so he was always at that telegraph key of his. Only a few of us knew her cargo. Hush, hush, top secret war stuff, you know. Damned fool mixture, if you ask me. His boss left as soon as I told him. Coleman started to leave then turned back to that telegraph key he sat at all day. He was thinking about those 300 souls aboard passenger train number 10, the overnight train from St. John, due in Halifax at 8.55. In a few minutes, it would pass directly in front of that floating bomb. With those little dots and dashes, he saved them all. Hold up the train, a munition ship afire in harbor, making for Pier 6, and will explode. Guess this will be my last message. Goodbye, boys. So dapper he was in his suit and high starched collar with that perfect pompadour and full mustache until he sent that last keystroke. He was the last thing I ever saw. Goodbye, boys. Now our next poet 
is Sasha Berman. And Sasha is going to rock your world. Come on, Sasha. The first poem is called Animation. The cobweb dancing on the ceiling fell and landed in my teacup. The curtain's loosened beads rolled underneath shoes impending instep. The frame prints on the wall jumped off weak wires and wobbly hooks. The tall shelf toppled over since it carried miles of books. Herbal remedies and canning jars cascaded off slippery shelves, broken glass and witches brew enough to cure life ills. Angelica and meadowsweet, Boswella stinging nettle, devil's claw and wintergreen, dried licorice root and yucca. I don't have time to speak right now. I'll call back when the smoke has cleared. <laughs> the telephone coil is round my neck, my shoulders wrapped up to my ears. My only son, the minimalist, with a house that has no dust. Dust protects my furniture, dim light, and providence. The storage bin. Moldy boxes of square cloth patches to someday grace a quilt. Exercise machines long inverted to aid in losing weight. Old Christmas gifts unopened from relatives now gone. Chip pieces of an aged puzzle parts from tangled former lives. Claimed objects that hold fulfillment stored in dampened rental cubes worth buckets full of questions sit incurring monthly dues. Cobwebs woven into cobwebs sleep alone in darkened rooms. Once upon an acid trip, I became my rocking chair. Now I polish it twice daily, rub walnut molecules with care. Yet, they can't bolster heart's acceptance of a self-destructing world. They can't fill small, empty cracks inside or heal the grasping mind. They can't bring back former lovers or anguished loved ones gone to rest. They can't feed the wasting hungry or fuel the mind's need to adjust. Sweet memories, torn photographs, show life as it once was. They can't rebuild burned down houses or still beams holding up charred walls. If they could, we'd all be hoarders building dams to stop the flood. This is called the hunter's joy and plight. We hunt and gather, buy and sell. We swim in memorabilia. We hug and recognize our fate, enticed by thrill, thrills of findings, treasures small as mustard seeds, large as life's unfolding. My friends are artful gatherers, contortionist collectors. They twist themselves round crowded shelves, more stuff on every floorboard, confined to rooms once large enough to sleep and work and eat in, antiquated piles of once upon a times invade the space for daily living. The dumpster dive. The cell phone rings inside my smaller pocket my friend is calling from a dumpster. I fumble for my car keys wedged inside my jacket pocket. I dress in rubber boots and rubber gloves, and then I start to rummage. Students and graduates now en route to families who have loaned them. We leave pretense behind and change into those who rummage through dust dumpsters of refuse. 
the trash imbued with extended discards, recycled by poets aware of vast waste, a time-honored tradition, a ritual rite, to sift through remains young scholars have left, discarded ideas and values that parents imprinted and sealed, pages of once encrypted inscription, hand-knit sweaters stuffed in torn laundry bags, devices purchased by moms and great aunts, popcorn poppers, toaster ovens, mountains of books, harlequin romances, comics, lang and cant, collected tidbits that paint an abstract picture, betray hidden veneers, define youthful elixir. Andy Warhol down back alleys on the brink of famous grind, pulled common works from streets decay, proclaimed soup cans people's art. Thank you. Um, our next poet is Jerry, and uh, Jerry is one of our fine poets who makes, who creates worlds. So I hope that you will be drawn into the worlds that he creates. Uh, this first one is called Spent, like, like all our money, and, um, and it's a fiction. This is just a fictional story, okay? I tried convincing my son to let me make love to his mother, but he wouldn't. So I kicked him in the stomach, after which he coughed nonstop until morning. The doctor wanted me arrested for child abuse. The nurse wanted me tested for drugs. I threw myself on the mercy of my wife and whichever hospital administrator would admit that I had been falsely admitted. They said I needed a quick vasectomy. I said I'd read that novel and had no intention of being a cheap imitation. They said, no worry, they'd help me out from under their desperate measures. Their clutches suddenly loosened. I managed to climb a laundry chute. I didn't even change my clothes. Suddenly, nobody recognized me. My son mistook me for Mr. Clean. His mother saw through my smoke screen, but by then she discovered Tai Chi and had no time for me and my lawless breed. I made myself calm, and while it may be hard to maintain, it's the state with the least pain, which may be the only way to age without decrepitude. A way to walk down roads that don't look like roads until you're on them. But with the wind off the wilderness, you'll know you're alone, and the years will be ribbons. That's spent. Next one is called My Son. It's a very short, very short poem. My son has a coleus growing from his shoulder. I beg him to have it removed. He says it makes him strong. We all eat garbage while he makes meals fit for the gods with his photosynthetic cell. These next two are, are very new, and I don't usually do this, but I just sort of like figure, I don't know, I can trust myself here that this isn't so bad. And also, um, you know, I've been doing this stuff for years and wondering when the, the prophetic part of, of poetry is going to kick in, and I think it finally has. I think I find my prophetic voice here, and this was called, Mark My Word and the New World Order. Mark my word, his mother used to say. If you don't eat your meat, you can't have dessert. Mark would not eat his meat. He thought it tasted rank. He liked toast. He liked ginger ale. He was a carbohydrate metabolizer. He turned compound sentences into complex enzymes. He turned professional at the age of eight. He ate nine kinds of special K. People thought he was weird. Then he made friends with other kids who didn't like meat. They started a blog. Then they made a Facebook homepage. They made friends by the thousands. Actually, Facebook limited the number of friends that Mark My Word could have. Facebook didn't want anybody becoming so powerful they could take over the world. Mark got around this by setting up different accounts, all with the goal of meat leavers of the world unite. There was Upchuck Charlie, there was Carly No Bones, Chicken Free Bonnie and Meatless Jack, there was Porkless Pablo and Geraldo Hog Hero, they all had the maximum number of friends. Soon they were on the news, mark my word, spreading the word about the coming wave of vegan domination. 
It gave rise to reactionary forces. There was a pure protein league, the PPL, celebrating a million years of minds and bodies made strong by meat and meat products. There were groups that stockpiled guns and swords. Dehumanizing slogans appeared. Tensions mounted. Civil war seemed imminent. Suddenly, before a shot could be fired, Mark and his followers backed down. What could they do? If they wouldn't eat meat, they certainly wouldn't stab or shoot their fellow humans. But some of them wanted war. They said they only gave up meat because they didn't like the taste, not because they didn't believe in killing. So now there was dissension in the ranks of the anti-meat wing of humanity. Where would it end, I ask you, where would it end? Yeah. This next one's called Cowards on Parade. Overcome resistance. Stand up for what you believe. Don't be a coward. Okay, go ahead, be a coward. No one cares. Nobody else is doing anything. Why should you? The boss likes it better this way. Don't disturb the peace. Can't you feel it? It's peaceful. It's better this way. Don't start that machine. It makes too much noise. Don't use machines to milk cows. Use your hands. Wash them first. Then wash them again when you're done. Milking machines are for the birds. Get to know the cows whose milk you drink. Get to know the cow you want to eat and maybe change your mind about eating it in the first place. At least admit that being at the top of the food chain doesn't mean you have the moral high ground. The least you can do is admit that you're not so great. So go ahead, eat the cow, be a coward. That's all it means. It doesn't mean you're afraid to fight. Cowards know how to fight. Don't tell me I'm wrong. I know I'm wrong. I don't need to hear it. I'd rather be wrong. Give me a bite of that cow, right now. Cowards unite, here we come. Look out disease, we're gonna get you. Look out parade, we'll float your boat. Watch your step, holy Joe, hiding in the jungle. We'll find you one of these days. Here we go, up two, here we go, three, four. Don't step in a cow pie. Don't sell yourself short. You haven't come this far just to entertain the troops. You've only just begun to fight. You haven't seen the whites of their eyes. You haven't lost control. You haven't had a cow. You haven't lived till you tried our protein shake. You've never even bitten the head off a snake. You don't know the meaning of success, so look it up. There's a picture of a hamburger with juice dripping from the bun. It's in the secret formula. It's in the sauce. Don't touch that dial. <laughs> this one's called Yes It Was, and it was published uh, a couple of years ago in this online magazine from, I don't know, California State College, I think somewhere, Santa Barbara, called Verdad is the name of the magazine. It's called Yes It Was. It was the largest morning any of us had ever witnessed. It rushed over the horizon, and you'd have thought all the laundry had gotten up and hung itself to dry. It was such an optimist morning. Clearly, the clear bells rang. Openly gay sermons were sung. Angela buried her recently purchased bulbs, and the bicycles bulged with the noise of compressed air. Crowds of sealed air raged to burst through the walls of the tires. No cars moved. A few birds refused to be believed. Hot sands from yesterday's furnace took the cool air of the night and bristled in anticipation of its role as the new face of an ancient planet. It was the largest morning. Even our feet shone with new pride. Music blasted from radios long thought dead. Guitars with young men to play them, their voices raw with loud desire, suppressed belches, slow news. It was by far the largest morning. There was no way anyone could spend it. All we could do was sit back and take as much of it in as we quietly could, because even with music it was quiet. The morning was so large that sound itself got lost in it. One minute you heard the guitars, the crows and the sparrows, and the next this large silence descended over everything, asserting nothing but suppressing nothing either. And then the largest morning suddenly expanded, and we really started waking up to obligations. It was like we'd been living in a kettle and the lid was blown off by a strong, gentle wind, or taken by a hand. Was it God's? Who's to say? The largest morning welcomes all levels of belief and attempts at explanation. It's big enough to justify itself, though none of us can follow the argument. It has something to do with the way the sun rose. See Emily for a de detailed description. But it has to do with the size of the sun, too, and the sky it rose into. The clouds it lit up and shoved aside so that its rays touched the roofs and windows, treetops casting shadows, the way we were ready for it after years of trial and error, where maybe mornings weren't really small, maybe it was our minds that were unable to see that this was something large, 
something with the potential to wake us up in ways we'd never been awakened. And yet there was nothing we could do but try to take it in. The largest morning, almost the dawn of a new era. Too bad it wouldn't last. Maybe held on to long enough it would yield itself up to the largest afternoon, the largest day, the longest night, or maybe we'd go timeless. That's it. Thank you. So without further delay, let us welcome Marion Kent. So this first poem has a working title provided by Twilight, which is I'm going to miss the cat, although I may change this title. And some of you have heard this. How could you know in the night that your fight would be the last before her leaving in the morning? Why would you believe it when she said, I will be gone in the morning, that heated words, clenched fists of this night would mean the end? You were in this thing for forever. Never did you anticipate that she would rise after you left for work, pack in the cat and all the rice and her cherry mirrored bureau into her station wagon, a note on the table greeting you at the end of your day, warning, I'll be back for the rest while you're away. You could not have known that you would hold on even while letting go, the sick in your stomach rising up, discomfiting you over and over again. If you'd known it all that morning, you would have kissed her goodbye. And this is a very new one on the same subject called Subaru. On my way to work, I followed a car like yours and imagined you with all you held dear stuffed inside, slowly driving away. In the car ahead, sturdy straps tethered a car seat, positioned in the middle for safety. What might have been if we had continued to focus on what was safe? I'm grateful for the letting go. And you must have a different car by now. All right. So I have this new book, and now I have to shuffle around and figure out what page I'm on. OK. This is called, oh, and it's called Responsive Pleading. And the artist is Max Germer, who's a local musician and, uh, and an artist. This is called In Dreams. Don your paisley shirt, waist dressed, Pad barefoot to the garden and spread your blanket on the lawn. As you place the teacups, Lucille Ball appears and drops a cake. She puts her hand on your breast and becomes your best friend from school, transfers a piece of gum in her kiss. You chew. She straddles you. The gum gets huge and hard. You can't talk or swallow or breathe. You hurl it in the grass. Then your teeth start to crumble. The blanket catches fire. Your cats disappear. You run to catch your children who have made it to the street. Now you're lost in a highway maze, searching for your babies. This poem is, uh, has local interest. It's called The Brass Cat. Is anyone here? I live in East Hampton. Thank you, East Hampton. The Brass Cat is in East Hampton, and you can all go there for a beer when we're done here. <clears throat> a Brass Cat. You can stop in for a pint and peanuts, finding yourself belly to the bar, alongside the guy whose record you know by, by heart still, whose concert poster hugely adorned the wall above your co-ed bed. Brand new friend. And that's for Lloyd Cole, if anyone who lives here, shockingly. OK, this one is. Uh, called Lake Keith, Ze Lake Keith Zettelmoyer. Keith Zettelmoyer is the first man to be killed in the state of Pennsylvania in 1995 at the age of 39 when Pennsylvania reinstated the death penalty. And I happen to live, I'm from Pennsylvania, and I lived in central Pennsylvania near State College in a little place called Fisherman's Paradise, which is actually in Belfont, Pennsylvania, in a cabin. Very bucolic and beautiful with rolling farmlands that you'd drive through to get to it. And the farmlands were owned by the prison, which is where, in Pennsylvania, prisoners are executed. <clears throat> and it's very, when I moved to Massachusetts, I, I, I was kind of unfamiliar with the landscape here. And I was struck by how similar the landscape of Western Massachusetts is to Pennsylvania, and especially central Pennsylvania. So this poem takes us from Hadley to uh, Pennsylvania. 
<clears throat> like Keith Zettelmeyer, young girl with hair flying, lugging an impossibly large pack on wheels, runs down a driveway for the school bus, passing a plastic rural mailbox held together with duct tape. A line of cars behind me snaking through the farm fields, my hair blown by the defroster. Why I grew my hair long, a line of cars that first spring day snaking through the farm fields on our early evening commute, her hair blown through open windows under an impossibly blue sky, snaking through the killing fields of Rockview State Prison, where a man had come to die. <coughs> this one's called Abad. <clears throat> Beyond the wretched waters, hijiki like sinew serpent tongue, swirling, stinking passiflora, longest viney fingers grasping and transformed, my hands on your face, arms wrapping you in woolest flannel. Beyond the maze of city streets in which a child can lose himself, stalked like so much savage prey, Beyond the deepish, blackish forest, willow branches like death wisps, I reach for you this morning, love. Here in our four-poster, here gazing at the water-stained ceiling, our untamed scent hangs on the air. Here beyond what night, night rains on you until little feet patter downstairs and little bodies press against ours. Beyond all of that, Tender moments, each more fragile than the last, fleeting before the workday begins with coffee, morning things, and my leave. So fleeting, we must grasp this, look it straight in the eye, and love it hard. I was going to finish with that, kind of like an ending, but then Brooks's poems about her grandchildren made me feel like I should read all the poems about my kids, and I'm not going to do that, but I'm going to read one. I have a bunch of poems about sleeping with my kids. This is one of them, sorry. It's called Basic Human Needs. Sleeping, dreaming, drowsing, awakened predictably by one, then two little bodies in my bed with their little voices, cold limbs and big needs, they snuggle in, then drift back to sleep. Mama's awake at 3 a.m., starting to count sheep, when a cozy little girl voice, the six-year-old now, says in her sleep, I love you, Mama. Mama replies, I love you, baby. Then the drifting, sleeping voice says, my butt isn't getting any blankets. <laughs> Thanks. It's always interesting. <laughs> <clears throat> Descent. The two of us started down the steps, the unending steps, to the beach below, holding gray rails, dizzy with height. We forgot the view, stopped at each platform, repositioned our hold on canvas and metal chairs, cutting into armpits, slipped but didn't fall, seemed a long journey. Finally, the sand singed our footprints. We laid out a blanket, unfolded the chairs, positioned a picnic, sank into our seats, breathed in the sun, looked to the horizon, took a double take, pointed, shouted, whale spouts, then a fin, a tail, a shiny slick left by a humpback a tribute to our descent. Mm -hmm. Tulip tree. Under tulip tree atop the hill, a girl grew long and sinewy, like the vines that tried to climb the ancient tree to no avail. But she reached the lowest branches easily and climbed up high where she could see the river and the rooftops below. She knew each tree's name, which flowers came in spring, 
which fruit in summer. Her bare feet grabbed the earth, walked easily among the mud and rocks. Her hands touched each tree as she played. The animals knew her footstep, and she knew their cries. It was a perfect haven until they moved away. In the city, trees were small and weak, their roots bound small circles in pavement, branches too symmetrical. Even old trees in the park seemed to breathe in short gasps the dirty air while pigeons coughed among the spindly branches. Years later, she returned to visit, was afraid to look, but yes, the tulip tree was gone. Pine tree. The wind susurrates, whispers, in the pine, planted out back for a windbreak. The sapling grew larger than anticipated. In fact, she is the tallest in the neighborhood, and her children thrive down the block on all sides. The sun, this is a, the, the prompt to this, this is, I just read this, I think, last night or yesterday or something. Um, this is the prompt I uh, got from talking to Marion about her cake that she made. She made it, it's a long story, so I won't tell the whole story, but she, I thought it was really cool because she posted this picture of a duck cake. It was so cute, it was a little ducky. And, we're, and I, somebody said, this girl who was talking to you, she said, what flavor is it? And you said, yellow. <laughs> and so I, I was thinking about synesthesia, where, where you know, different senses are mixed. So I, I told everybody, go ahead. And, I'm the first one who've written one. I'm looking for some more. I've been working on Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> Everybody's been busy, but I expect one in the next two weeks. Er. <laughs> the sunset tasted like a plan she made, as yellow melted like wax petals, and the smell was broad, textured, and burnt like thunder. I wrote this today, being very brave. <laughs> I never do this. The uh, the prompt I don't remember. It was someone online, but uh, it's oh I guess it was Lisa. It starts with I have been, and and I, I love that as a you know, it's really a, a it's sort of a traditional piece. So you know in terms of the the, the litany. Uh, yeah, yeah, so I had fun with this. I have been a camel in loading season, carrying groceries up the long stairs toting baby seats in carriages, rhythming children on my hip, holding water until the next oasis. <laughs> I have been a raccoon at the stream, prepping, cutting carrots, celery, then dumping them in soup stock, or in a pan beside a trust bird, feeding and feeding, forgetting my own needs. I have been the nightingale, humming and chortling the soft notes of a lullaby, of the song in my head, of the stories we made up together, their early reader, their first teacher. I have been a woman with children, the calming one, the sensible one, whose voice cheers, comforts, instructs, who has an opinion about her own life and a right to choose her own path. You tell me a little mad at some certain political people this week. Anyway, so this one's about writing, this last one. Um, I wrote this the other day, um, Oracle. She said, pay heed to the magic and it's not that I don't believe in magic. It's just that last time I heeded anyone, it didn't end so well. So instead of heeding others, I think I'll make my own. For instance, to write about it, 
empties the hurt. A sweet catharsis, a joy. And if that's not magic, well, you know it is. So pay heed to the magic and write. So. <laughs> Our next poet, Anita Gallers. This is called Mad Intensifiers. She was mad. She was wicked mad. She was dumb mad. She was mad mad. He was dumb. He was wicked dumb. He was mad dumb. He was dumb dumb. <laughs> and a little seasonal poem called Peep. The marshmallow chick shakes in its sugar coating as I place it in the microwave. <laughs> Behind the glass, I see its mouth open round, then twist in pain. Its chest expands to howl, but over the appliance's loud hum, I hear nothing. Until the final beep, then silence. I pop open the door, not a peep. <laughs> And since I did an Easter-related poem, as a Jew, I feel obligated to do a Jew poem, too. So, this is called Semitic Semantics. Thank you. Right? All right. To marketing and sales representatives everywhere, on behalf of Jews everywhere, do not send us mailings or spam or leave us voicemails announcing that we have been selected for anything, ever. It may be hard for you to understand, I know it seems subtle, but for us, there is a big difference between selected and chosen. Uh, this is called Car Song, and it was actually written at work um, I work at a school for young moms, and we have a poetry program, and very, very occasionally, I actually have time to attend the poetry, I'm not the poetry teacher, but I sometimes attend the poetry class with my students, so this came out of that class, actually, and it's called Car Song. Sing the rugged motor, all four pumping cylinders, atria and ventricles of a fully beating heart. Sing the life spark, the brain waves, the dashboard opening its eyes, the breath in the vents. Sing the bong, bong, bong of the seatbelt warning, the click, click of the blinking signal light. Sing the rumble, the hum, the cough. Sing the coffee in the cup holder, the tic tacs rattling in the little compartment below the radio. Sing the outlet where the cell phone is plugged in, and sing the memory of the cigarette lighter that used to pop orange hot from its belly button. Sing the receipts and old directions papering the back seat floor. Sing the dent in the roof where a rock hit at 70 miles an hour, the mud caked on the chassis, the tire tread sticky grip. Sing the hands that assembled that chassis somewhere in Michigan, the calluses rubbed over ever-decreasing paychecks. Sing the airbag stuffed down in its hole, waiting to pop. Sing the turning wheels, the steering column. Sing the gear shift. Sing park and neutral. Sing drive and reverse. Sing the road, the lines, the time, the motion, the motion, the motion. Um, as I said, in my day job, I'm a teacher. And I left work yesterday feeling some type of way, as we say in Holyoke. And so I thought I would read some poems about work to make me feel some other type of way. Um, so this poem uh, is also part of the shameless plug portion of the evening. So this was in the Silkworm Five, which is the uh, Silkworm is the annual Florence Poet Society publication, and that was themed um, love poems. So this is a love poem, uh, but actually the next one will be out. Do we have an ETA on the next Silkworm? Sometime this year. Memorial Day. Really? Yeah. Memorial Day. It'll be out. And the theme this time around is sex, drugs, and rock and roll, so it's going to be a tiny bit awesome. Um, so, but this is from the last one, Love Poems, and uh, this is for my students. This is called My Ghetto Girls. 
to look at me. You wouldn't think I know any ghetto girls, much less have some I consider mine. And if you ask me how I dare to be so proprietary and do I want to be called Massa, I can only say that my ghetto girls are mine because I can see them and hear them. I like them and value them for who they are. I admire them and I'm inspired by them. My ghetto girls are mine because I see their brilliance and I want them to let it shine. To put it on every morning and not leave it on the nightstand at night because mija, no amount of gold through your ears, around your neck, on your fingers, or all the way up both arms can outshine your inner bling. My ghetto girls are mine because trust is a two-way street, and I'm not asking for any respect I don't offer first. I don't respond well to bullshit, but I'm not dishing it out either. Talking shit, on the other hand, is a whole other story, and my ghetto girls are mine because fíjate, when we talk about everything and nothing, I am not afraid to go there. Au contraire, I'll share. <laughs> You're mine, my ghetto girls, because you make me think about things I've never thought about before. You make me think about things I have thought about before in new ways. You make me think about things. You make me wonder, am I too old to pierce my nose like that? <laughs> How would gold hoops with Anita emblazoned in cursive letters across their three-inch diameters look in my borgy white earlobes? Could I manage all the stuff you do? And since I don't know the half of it, could I manage double the stuff I imagine you do? My ghetto girls, you're mine because on a very good day, I can glimpse something out of the corner of my eye when you ask me for help when you include me in your sentence by ending it, you know, when you speak Spanish, not because you think I won't understand, but because you know I will, when you check to see if I'm laughing along, when you're curious about me, when you share your platanos or your tostones or your dreams, and I can tell that I am yours too. You're mine, my ghetto girls, because you're among the strongest women I know, the most ingenious women I know, the most generous women I know, the most fragile women I know, the most resilient women I know, and I am damn lucky you were mine, yo. Oh. Oh. Wow. All right, I'm gonna skip one. Uh, I'm gonna skip to the end. All right, um, so the last one, um, this is a little fluffernutter I call spoken word abracadabra. <clears throat> As long as I keep talking fast, all you'll notice is the sound, the sass, the words unbound. Did I lose you? You found me. You'll always find me. Every time I hit a rhyme, spit out a new line, your ears are telling you everything's fine, but you're all goofy from the verbal roofie I'm slipping in your beverage, my flip lip leverage to make you revel in the clever. As long as I never stop with the relentless torrent, a constant current, I will not desist unless you've got a warrant for my arrest. This is a test, but this is not a test. You will wake up tomorrow in bed, undressed, with a sore head and no memory of what I said. Because it was all empty, humpty dumpty, no focus, hocus pocus. A high colonic of sonic tonic, manic ruckus for suckers. It's all misdirection so I can escape detection. Even though on closer inspection, after the fact, you realize you've been hacked with a bunch of oral crap because I didn't say Jack. <laughs> Thanks, all. Hey. Welcome Bob Lipton to the stage. <laughs> I'm a, a very impatient person, so I've decided I'm going to do a retrospective of my future poems. <laughs> and uh, this is not all, oh, comparisons are invidious, of course, but uh, Anita made me think of uh, a ghetto encounter that I had some years ago, and I don't think I've ever read this poem uh, uh, publicly, so I will... Uh, I will do it now. It's called Repartee on Main Street, uh, Main Street, a true story. Girlfriend, you a lion bitch. One maybe 15 year old, more or less, I would guess, girl to another, overheard passing by on a sidewalk in one of America's surfeit of Springfields. I am 
strictly, studiedly, minding, I can assure you, my own business, but these round, wide girls aren't shy, care nothing for the opinion of some old white guy sitting in his car with the windows rolled down. Well, why would they? Why should they? Well, if I a lion bitch, then you a motherfucker. So perhaps not the perfect squelch, but a minimally witty rejoinder declared in a tone of most perfect equanimity enough to satisfy honor. I know, watching them down the block, arm in arm, they will be friends to the end, fortunate girls. And now to the, pre now to the planned portion of our, uh, our evening. I will warn you, I intend to take up my entire uh, eight minutes. I read a lot of poems in the parking lots. This one is called Checking Out. Patience, I like to think, is the first among my myriad of virtues. So when the front desk librarian asks me, are you ready to check out, I tell her, take your time. I'm always ready to check out, although I like to think I have some years remaining. I know you're only doing your job, I say, when she tells me the due date for the books I'm borrowing, a pair of thrillers and the collected poems of Philip Larkin. But look at my accumulated finds. You can see that due dates mean little or nothing to a man like me. When my total amounts to $10, I intend to decamp for a country with which we have no extradition treaty. Some place with talcum powder beaches and soft-eyed ripening girls who will fill the ingenue roles in an old man's valedictory fantasies. Wow. Something a bit more philosophical for the intellectuals in the crowd. When men become gods, before there was anything, before the big bang of God in a potentiality pinpoint, there was nothing, no outline, no format, no template. God had no experience, nor guidance, nor excess of caution, nor lack of hubris. Hopefully, we can learn from all his mistakes. Yes, when men become gods, things are going to change. Some assembly, reti some assembly required batteries not included. There will be less nattering and hopefully more poetry when men become gods. Don't hold your breath though. What are the odds? <laughs> Do I have any objectivists in the audience? Any big Ayn Rand fans? Uh, leave now. <laughs> this is called Ex Cathedra. And the Catholics can explain to the Jews what that means. <laughs> All reality is objective, avers the divine Ms. Rand. She holds this as a matter of faith, of course, her own scripture in her hand. She's a presence on her plushy throne while preaching her non-religion, genuflected to by her acolytes, that flock of credulous pigeons. Not one of those collective lads, but would crawl to win her favors, although her constant cigarettes lend her kisses an ashtray flavor. Rank altruism is her bane. She deplores the public teat. But she orders young Al Greenspan, come here, boy, rub my feet. Now cheer, gang, for pure selfishness and celebrates Rand, Rand's rational ego. Now raise your glass to this horse's ass who would decree the way that we go. Here, here. This one's a bit more serious, also a bit shorter, uh, and uh, one that I'm, uh, I'm actually very, uh, very proud of. Maybe I shouldn't say that in case you disagree. This is called The Day. <clears throat> Sometimes the day is very still. Sometimes it moves like a wounded animal 
from one patch of cover to the next. Other times it proceeds occasionally or in little clicking jumps, like the big hand on the clock that hangs above the classroom door. Some consolation. Everyone complains one can't buy tasty tomatoes anymore. Soon all of us who remember the tomatoey sapidity of a ripe brandy wine will be gone. One less thing in the world to gripe about. Just uh, two more, both of them written uh, this week, one uh, actually earlier today. This one is called uh, Armchair Activist. Uh, starts with an epigraph. If the bee disappears off the surface of the globe, then man would only have four years of life left, <coughs> said Albert Einstein. Ooh, that Albert, he was a real Einstein. And not for nothing would I sell him short, but in this case I'm hoping he's strayed outside his wanted area of expertise. Albert, he's scaring me. Him and the colony collapse of the bees, they're scaring the crap, don't you see, out of me. This is no laughing matter. I definitely deplore it. No longer can I ignore it, this deplorable condition, the planet spiraling down to perdition, not to mention extraordinary rendition, signs of the times. I guess I'll have to sign yet another online petition. <laughs> and I will close with, uh, uh, like Laurie said, I, I rarely do a poem that I just wrote the same day, maybe yesterday, but not the same day. Uh, but I did want to end on a somewhat happier note. This is called uh, Celebration. I celebrate the shining path straight to the moon on the shimmering water, and the wing whir of the golden bees, givers of crops and the sweet air and the clean rain and the iced mountaintops, the broad-leafed trees, tall palms and the pines and all that inhabit them, the islands barely above the waves and the jungle-cloaked volcanic thrusts and the lagoons of unbleached coral, the animals that nurture their young and those that abandon theirs all according to necessity sun and cloud and the freckling of stars across the black skin of night and all of nature which means i celebrate myself and you i celebrate joy the unstiflable laughter of children don't let the rich bastards have all the champagne We've come to the end of our program for the evening. I'm going to read a poem. It's one poem. It's eight pages long. For tonight, I pulled out an old chestnut. And in honor of Luke Kavignac and his baseball, love of baseball, I shall read a poem called Minor Poet, which is about a minor league baseball player. The fat-faced sides of the old bus were in shake, so blue, dull, and dry. Black rubber clouds make everything diesel as summer's hot afternoon lies still in a squeal and hush of air brakes. In another town like the last town, and the town before that, where cow pasture fields run chip paint fences, sun bleached to a color you can't buy at Moe's, the local paint and hardware store, 
on the billboard in the outfield. Squinty, sleepy-eyed, he stumbles off the bus. Hung over, dusty spikes over his shoulder, slap leather glove tucked under his arm, one huge meat market hand grips his bat. A war club lathe from blanks he'd split himself the winter before last. From the big backyard maple that broke in the ice storm. Because you can't buy maple bats no more anywhere. And he likes them heavy and hard with the handle shaved smooth and the barrel left thick and long. He made a baker's dozen of them, flame hardened with a torch, dipped in varnish ten times, sanded carefully between each coat. Hopefully, they'll last the season. He would rather die than listen to the clink of metal. He learned to hit swinging a broken shovel handle at rocks and potatoes in his grandfather's field. Spring train to him means cutting back on the cigars and chopping wood and swimming in his underwear across the ice flow river in March. These candy ass, juiced up, muscle head freaks of today disgust him. They go against everything he stands for. The roar of the crowd is the hum of insects. The money is a joke. He toils in obscurity for one sweet stroke. One moment of driving passion where bat meets ball and explodes. He doesn't have the credentials or the speed. He'll never make the big time. He's just hanging on. Everything about him screams fool, but he has persistence. They still let him play. No, you couldn't stop him. Oh, they talk about him behind his back. The bonus babies laugh at him. The front office kicks him around. He's a brute, a bumpkin, a clown, a ham and egg loser who never won and never will. But that doesn't stop him from trying. He believes hitting a baseball to be a holy moment of grace a sacred truth that cannot be compromised. For him, the kid was right. It's all about the perfection of the swing and the timing. He knows he doesn't have the vision, the reflexes or the power, but he lives for that connection. It's an addiction, the crack of the bat. There is no cure. Now, the big sky dims and the lights come on. There's maybe a couple of dozen fans left in the grandstand getting pissed on watered-down beer. When he steps up to the plate in the top of the night, at the end of an endless doubleheader, he taps his bat, raising a small plume of dust. It has been one long, hot day. Even the mosquitoes are too lazy to bite. They wither, bored in the lifeless air. A few of the fans muster the energy to groan. He went 0 for 6 in the first game, but that's not why. In his last time at bat, he ripped a screamer to right, which the outfielder casually scooped up on one bounce and then easily threw him out at first. The pitcher glares in disgust. The catcher signals one finger down and taps the inside thigh, high and tight and high. Here's the wind up and he swings at the heat wave blur. He can barely see. Strike one! The umpire bellows as the ball smacks the mitt with a vicious slap that echoes across the grass. And so the dance continues. But the result is the same. Our batter cannot catch up to this guy's flame ball. No freaking way, brother. Steer right to the umpire gutters. The pitcher grins. Finish it now. The catcher signs. Bring it in with a bullet one more time. But the pitcher 
shakes off the sign. He's looking for the number two. The catcher goes along. Okay, maybe this guy was dangerous once, but that was a long time gone. Throw this idiot some junk if that's what you gotta do. Let's make him look. Let's make him look like a fool. And then, there it is. The curveball hanging there as huge in the sky as a goddamn harvest moon and everything slides switches into slow motion and everything the batter has ever wanted and waited for and wished for his whole life becomes clear every dream and desire of every pathetic bum who ever tried to beat the house becomes locked into this one moment his nostrils flare his eyes open impossible why he steps into it and swings with everything he got Crack! He gets all of it. But no, not quite. He gets under it just a hair and drives it high, high, high into the air. Something tells him to run. Run! He drops his bat and digs for first like he's pulling a plow down the line in reverse. Meanwhile, no one notices. All eyes are on the sky as he rounds first and the ball is still up there, well beyond the lights in that rinky-dink park, still climbing way out of sight. He's heading for second, puffing and belching like an old steam train, picking up speed, but the ball is still nowhere to be seen. And everyone is staring into the gathering dusk, searching for meaning in this twilight universe. There it is! Somebody screams as he's rounding second, headed for third. I got it, I got it, the left fielder calls. But as the ball comes down, it collides with a bird. <laughs> now, in all the confusion, the left and the center fielder crash into each other. The ball drops on one side and the bird on the other. The left, peel, left fielder picks up the bird and fires it into second. <laughs> the center fielder is out cold. The ball down in the grass right next to him. The third base coach windmills his arms. Come on, come on, go, go, go. The wheels are coming off the train as our man rounds third, digging for home. The left fielder realizes his mistake and grabs the ball. He lets loose a throw from the base of the wall that sings a lonesome song all the way home on one hop to the plate where our hero will meet his fate. Diving, sliding, crawling in, his pinky finger reaches for the corner as the catcher tries to block him out. There's a cloud of dust and no one can see as the umpire grunts, you're out. He just lays there down in the dirt as both teams leave the field. There are a few boos and a few cheers, but really nothing much is revealed. What's left of the crowd heads out the gate. No one looks back. He picks himself up slowly. He's covered with dirt, sweat, and blood. He brushes himself off and rises up to his full height. He surveys the empty stands, tips his cap. The lights go out one by one. The beer is gonna taste good tonight. Thank you for joining us at the Invisible Foundation.